Hi, everybody. My name is Vivian Schiller. I'm the executive director of Aspen Digital. We are a program of the Aspen Institute. Thank you for joining us for Disinfo Discussions. This is our series of briefings on mis and disinformation hosted by the Aspen Institute and in conjunction with the Aspen Commission on Information Disorder. As part of this series, we're talking to top experts in the field who can help us make sense of the various angles of the information crisis. Today, we are talking about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, arguably one of the most important and also least understood uh, pieces of legislation about the internet. There's a lot of talk about how it needs to be reformed or even entirely rescinded. So what is this all about? Luckily today, I'm speaking to two of the foremost experts on Section 230. We have Marianne Franks, professor of law at the University of Miami. She is a nationally and internationally recognized expert on the intersection of civil rights and technology. She is the author of the award-winning book, The Cult of the Constitution, Our Deadly Devotion to Guns and Free Speech. And her second book, Fearless Speech, is expected in 2022. And we have Jeff Kossoff. He is an assistant professor of cybersecurity law at the United States Naval Academy's Cyber Science Department. He literally wrote the book on our topic. This book is called The 26 Words That Created the Internet, The History of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. It examines how Congress quietly passed this law quite some time ago and how it has shaped the internet and the costs and benefits of protecting online platforms. So Jeff, we are going to begin with you, um, again, since you literally wrote the book. So we're gonna start super basic. What is Section 230 and why was it created? So Section 230, uh, what, it, what it boils down to is it says that um, if there is some content on a platform that a user posted that's defamatory, harmful, and uh, you can sue the person who posted it, but in most cases, unless an exception applies, you can't sue the platform. So it gives the platform the discretion to either keep content up or take it down. Um, it's very much a market-based law, basically operating under the assumption that platforms will moderate content in the best interest of their users based on what their users demand, um, and rather than feeling pressure from litigation or from regulation. And Section 230 uh, really came into existence because there was really a lack of clarity under the legal system before 230. Uh, so 230 was passed in 1996, but to understand why you have to go back before that to, to what the standard of liability was for online services under the common law and the first amendment. And it wasn't totally clear because the courts had to uh, use standards for other companies that distribute content that people create so things like bookstores and newsstands. Um, and there was generally a standard that said a bookstore or newsstand is only liable if it knows or has reason to know of the defamatory or illegal content. Um, for online services that the courts had a bit of trouble applying that in the early 90s. So you have um, these services that now my students don't know what they are when I tell them about, uh, Prodigy and CompuServe, and they had very different approaches. CompuServe really didn't do any moderation. They had very few user content policies. So when they were sued for defamation, um, a judge dismissed the case and said, you know, as long as CompuServe didn't know about this defamatory content, it can't be held liable. Um, Prodigy wanted to be more family friendly. So they actually had much more extensive moderation and user content policies. So when they were sued for defamation, the judge said Prodigy does not receive that protection because it took steps to moderate content. So it's more like a newspaper that's strictly liable than a newsstand. And uh, so this was in 1995, 96, uh, when Congress was overhauling the telecom laws for the first time in six decades. And section 230 was an effort to say, okay, we wanna get rid of this perverse incentive and we actually want to encourage moderation. So Congress's real intent was if we take the courts and regulators out of this and we remove this disincentive to moderation, then the market will really kind of develop a, an adequate mechanism where platforms get rid of really the garbage and the harmful content based on user demand. Now, uh, obviously there are some good reasons to think the market has not really 
panned out uh, the way that Congress had, had intended more than a quarter century later, but that's basically at least the philosophy behind Section 230. It let this new industry grow without regulation and litigation. Right. And grow, it certainly has. Yes. And so, yeah, so, it, so, the, so two parts. They're not liable for the content that users post, and also they may make individual content decisions as they see fit without, without penalty. Yeah, so there are two provisions. There's the 26 words which say, you know, you're not liable for content someone else has created. And then there's a second provision that actually 230 got barely any attention in the media, but if anything did get attention, it's a second provision that says platforms are also are not liable for good faith efforts to remove objectionable content. Now, uh, that's rarely litigated, um, largely because it's very hard to find a cause of action for, uh, because of the First Amendment against a platform for making the choice to not uh, allow certain use of content. And uh, so it's really been the, the 26 words of protecting from liability for what they keep up that Section 230 has had a really big impact. Right. Okay. So, um, so Marianne, let's now fast forward. Um, here we are. It's 2021. There is, a, it's fair to say, obsession in many quarters with Section 230. Um, everybody seems unhappy with it for one reason or another, although those reasons seem to vary dramatically. So what's all that about? Why, why, why this incredibly intensive focus on Section 230? Well, as you said, there are very different reasons for objecting. So we have to really think about which direction these objections are coming from. So one of them is a bit more longstanding than the other. Um, let's say, let's start with that. Let's start with the concern that has actually been around for a really long time, but not really gotten all that much traction until recently, which is the concern about the part of Section 230 that, that Jeff referenced as the sort of more serious part or the, you know, the 26 words about essentially providing this kind of immunization for anything that you leave up. Um, so the concern has been ever since the 1990s on the parts of those people who are concerned about civil rights and concerned about impact on marginalized communities to say that what that really says is you platforms um, have a blank check to do basically um, nothing at all when it comes to controlling harassment, discrimination, um, other harmful conduct or content. And you can create platforms that not only are indifferent to uh, dealing with that kind of content, but actually you can create platforms that are going to facilitate, encourage and solicit that kind of content. And the concern being that that's going to not just make people unsafe, it's not just going to make for an unpleasant experience, it is actually going to mean um, something counter to what the promoters of Section 230 have always claimed, which is that Section 230 is about improving or facilitating free speech online. The idea being that if you do nothing about harassment, discrimination, rape threats, uh, revenge porn, et cetera, what you're going to get is a silencing of certain communities, a driving out of certain communities. And that criticism has been there all this time and just hasn't been um, really paid attention to very much because the people who articulate those concerns have never necessarily been the people in power. They're not the, 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 the tech lobby. They're not uh, major congressional players or haven't been until fairly recently. Then you have um, a very different kind of critique that is, also, that is a very recent vintage and it's highly politicized. And that is the critique coming mostly from the right that says, um, we're actually really upset about the provision that Jeff mentioned that you know, people really didn't talk about before, which is that um, you are allowed to take things down. So if we wanna think about it really crudely as the two parts of section 230 are the, are the leave up and the take down provisions, the sort of right wing um, push to criticize section 230 is attacking that you have the right to take things down provision. And as Jeff also mentioned, that's a really strange thing to take issue with because that's actually the part that we didn't really need Section 234 because the First Amendment tells private actors that they're allowed to make decisions about what kinds of content and, con um, content and conduct they want to allow. So the right wing focus on this has been, hey, we don't like the fact that you're able to take things down um, because we think um, that there is a bias or prejudice against conservative uh, content. And so we're actually going, we as in the, the right wing sort of push to criticize Section 230 is attacking that part, which again is essentially attacking the First Amendment's protections to say we're actually wanting to force you either to keep things up 
or to um, have all kinds of onerous obligations on you to explain your decisions as opposed to leaving it up to your own discretion. So really attacking the heart of, again, the story about Section 230, the, the, the nice story about Section 230, which is we want to encourage platforms to take more editorial decisions and more um, more discerning uh, decisions about what they're going to leave up. So you could say that's a very recent push on the part of mostly um, conservative uh, thinkers or figures who are saying we actually don't like the fact that companies have the First Amendment right or the private right to take things down. So that's kind of where we are right now. And it does tend to confuse the debate to some extent, because when people think about Section 230 criticism, sometimes all of that gets lumped in together, but as we've just discussed, they're very, very different points of critique. So in terms of that second that second part of Section 230, so to speak, around takedowns, um, that is concerned particularly on the right, as you say, uh, and often we hear complaints of this is a violation of my First Amendment protection, um, which of course doesn't make sense because they're private actors, but are you suggesting that actually that that sort of second part of Section 230, as, as we're calling it, isn't even necessary because the First Amendment protects the rights of the platforms to take down content as they see fit anyway? Is that exactly, the case? exactly that. So, so one of the great ironies of this debate is that the the thing that people say is that promote that we promote about the Section 230 protections that it's meant to provide all these protections to companies, private actors to take things down. The Good Samaritan provision, right, which is what it's called, that is to say, you know, focusing on the idea that companies can make their own decisions. One of the ironies there is that well, we don't need a law to tell you that companies have that right. They have that right because they are private entities. And whether it's a right of association or whether it's the right of free speech, which includes the right not to speak and the right not to be compelled by the government to speak, um, pretty much all of those powers are already captured and already um, based upon a First Amendment right of private actors. So it is incredibly ironic for conservative speakers to say my First Amendment rights are being violated. They've got it completely backwards. It's actually the right of the private platforms to kick them off if they want to. So we don't need it in the sense of um, there, there's a there's a much more serious backstop to why it is that these companies have these rights, and that's the First Amendment. Right. What Section 230 really does is provides a kind of procedural. Um, I don't even need to get I as a platform don't even need to get hauled into court to have to deal with this because I'm being told up front that this is something that I'm immunized from. So that's really what Section 230 is procedural and not substantive. Let me just ask you one more question, and I'm going to come back to you, Jeff. So. So you 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 framed uh, what the concerns are uh, of a lot of people on the right when it comes to Section 230, but many people on the left are equally as equally as exercised over Section 230 and want to see change too. Can you characterize what the concern there is? And then Jeff, I want to come to you and ask you about all the proposals that are on the table. So to be fair too, to say that there are people both on the right and the left who don't fall into these categories that I'm mentioning sure. here, but, but um, largely speaking, many people on the left are concerned with what I referenced before, which is the longstanding concern that the part where Section 230 does do something radical, the part that is not um, protect, that is not provided for in the First Amendment itself, which is leave up whatever you want, um, even encourage whatever you want, and you don't have to face any kind of liability, not criminal, not civil, not anything, with a few exceptions, right? Because there's carve outs for intellectual property and for violations of federal criminal law. That's huge, right? That's a huge kind of as I've sometimes referred to it, it's kind of a stand your ground for the internet, right? Go out there, cause, be as reckless as you want, cause as much harm as you want, but because you're not the actual person making the right threat or um, literally selling the, the gun um, to someone who shouldn't have it, you don't have any responsibility, you can't get sued. The concern on the left, I could say, and some people on the right are also concerned about this, is that it just creates this kind of perverse incentive structure for platforms to maximize um, their reckless behavior because they know they don't have to face any consequences for it and that the impact of that is always going to be the same kind of impact you see in kind of free market libertarianism outside of the internet, which is uh, more vulnerable groups get crushed and not just crushed economically or um, in terms of their safety and security, but also in terms of their ability to express themselves freely. Right. Okay, thank you. So that's very clear. So Jeff, I want to come back to you now. There are a lot of um, you know, proposals coming from all corners, whether it's for regulation or legislation um, uh, or, or voluntary compliance, what have you. Can you sort of, what, what are the, what are the sort of at, at a top line, what are the primary 
proposals of where Section 230 goes that are that are on the table right now that are be, that are being taken seriously. So there's a lot, and I won't go through each one uh, because we will be here all day. There have been many bills uh, introduced, but I, I categorize them really into three different uh, areas. Uh, the first, and there's only one bill that really fits into this, is more procedural reforms that gets at both sides of the debate that Marianne was talking about, um, which is the PACT Act, which uh, Senator Schultz and Thune introduced. So it's a bipartisan bill in the Senate. And it's much more sort of narrower, mostly procedural uh, reforms. So part of it would address some of the conservative concerns about, you know, they think that there are these platforms that are really biased against conservatives with their policies. So it would require more transparency in both their policies for when they remove content and have an appeals process. Um, at least for big platforms, they would have to have phone number that people could call um, and th those sorts of things. So that would get at that side of the concern. But they also um, address some of the issues related to harmful content. Uh, for example, uh, there was a ruling from the California Supreme Court that says that even if someone has a court order in a defamation lawsuit against the poster uh, that finds material to be defamatory, that the platforms are not, Section 230 prevents the platforms from being required with a court order to take down the content. Um, and so the PACT Act would eliminate that provision of Section 230 protection. Uh, it also would uh, make a number of other changes like allowing uh, federal, right now federal criminal law is exempt. It would extend that to federal civil law legal actions brought by federal agencies. So to expand that a little bit, um, so, so, so it would have narrower issues. So that's much more procedural. Uh, there are a number of bills introduced by conservatives um, over the past two or three years that would get at various issues of at least trying to restrict the ability of platforms to moderate content. Um, I think there are a lot of First Amendment issues with this. They, they get at it in different ways, such as um, say one, one bill would make section 230 protections contingent on a finding by the super, a super majority of the Federal Trade Commission that the platform's moderation is not politically biased. Um, I think that would raise some significant First Amendment concerns. Um, so there, there, there are other modifications to that second part of section 230 to narrow down the circumstances in which it applies only to certain types of content removal that I don't think would frankly have much of an impact because again, the first amendment protects this. Um, most recently, I haven't even seen the bill yet, but Senator Haggerty from Tennessee wrote an op-ed yesterday about a bill that he's introducing that would designate platforms as the biggest platforms as common carriers. Um, and I, I'm not quite, I haven't seen the bill, so I'm not entirely sure how that would work. Uh, I think it's probably not a coincidence. This is coming shortly after Justice Thomas issued a concurrence in which he suggested that uh, we consider whether big platforms are common carriers or public accommodations that um, can be regulated uh, and, and have, a, have a duty to carry people's speech. Uh, so there's a lot of proposals like that. And then finally, um, there are a uh, few bills that uh, get at the other concerns, which are the harmful content that remains up. Um, there is Senator Warner um, was the lead sponsor, uh, I, I think with uh, Senator Sereno and Klobuchar on um, a, a bill that creates a number of different exceptions to Section 230 based on the type of claims. So um, there would be certain claims related to harassment, certain claims related to civil rights, to antitrust, uh, to the Alien Tort Claims Act, and it would also um, restrict uh, the application of Section 230 to paid content, looking at least aiming toward the advertise protections for advertisements. Uh, there's the Earn It Act. Uh, that's also a bipartisan bill with Senators Graham and Blumenthal. Uh, that's done through a few iterations, um, and the most recent version of it uh, that was introduced uh, last year would um, create a commission. It's really focused on child sex abuse material. It would create a commission for 
figuring out how to um, play child sex abuse material distribution. And then it would also um, say that uh, Section 230 doesn't apply both to federal and state civil lawsuits related to uh, child sex abuse material as well as state criminal enforcement. Um, so those are the types that, that so, so there's a lot. Um, I, a, a lot of different proposals. I talk with members and their staffers uh, pretty regularly. And I'll just say that depending on who I'm talking with, it's like being in a different world. Um, there's um, some people who are really, really concerned about what they see as unfair, they, what they see in their worldview is, and, and I, I mean, it's a legitimate concern that we provide this massive protection that is unprecedented to this big industry. And they think this big industry is biased against them. Um, and they, and when I try to talk to them about, well, if you get rid of 230, <laughs> you're probably going to have more of your content taken down. It, it, for them, it's an issue of equity. Uh, but then you have a equal, equally vocal uh, group, and this is the side that I sympathize more with because I think it's a real problem, uh, it, which is concerned about the harmful content that stays up and the fact that the platforms have not been using this. Uh, real uh, tremendous power that they've been given uh, in the best ways to help society and protect people. Uh, and depending on who you talk with, uh, there's a whole different level of support for particular proposals. But um, I don't see anything that has a consensus or where people are crossing over and saying, yeah, even though I share the opposite concern, I, I think this bill is good. Um, it, it's really kind of a fractious debate right now. Is there, because this series of, of, of um, briefings that we're doing, like we're doing with you right now, focuses on um, you know, harms and solutions specifically around myths and disinformation. What, is there anything in any of these proposals or any of the viable proposals or anything that's, that, that, that would that would help solve for misinformation, you know, false information, untruths, <laughs> call it what you will, on these platforms. Would section, would any, does section 230 or any of the proposals about reform to section 230 have any impact on that? Or is it really mostly about sort of harm, directly harmful content to communities or incitements to violence or abuse, et cetera? Um, Mary, uh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. 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 I so I, there. There's nothing directly, and I, I mean, I, I think the problem is, and again, so, some of the problem uh, really on both sides is that you run up against the First Amendment. Uh, there. And so when you're talking about misinformation and disinformation, it really depends on what it actually is and whether there's a cause of action. Now, I think um, a lot of the misinformation and disinformation, as we've seen with some of the recent uh, lawsuits that have been filed regarding claims about the 2020 election is that there is some misinformation and disinformation that's also defamatory. So um, I think when talking about the PACT Act, um, for example, if there's a court order saying that something's defamatory, making it easier to get that taken down, that might help at the margins with some of the misinformation and disinformation. But again, we, I mean, the, the problem is you need to figure out what the cause of action is, and then you can see how a 230 change might fix that. Um, Marianne, what would happen? There, there have been uh, some, uh, including then candidate Biden on the campaign trail, I recall very distinctly, because I was surprised, who suggested we should just eliminate Section 230. If Section 230 magically were 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 uh, was undone tomorrow. What what would happen? What would our what would the what would the world look like? What would our what would the internet look like? What would the platforms look like? It's a bit of a leading question. <laughs> we don't know, right? I mean, so this is one of the the fun things about counterfactuals is that we don't actually know <laughs> what would happen. But um, one thing we could guess is that because Section Two Thirty has been a given for so long that it would be massively disruptive to the current landscape because something that companies have relied upon um, for so long would suddenly be gone. 
Um, I think we could also suggest that that after a certain period of time, though, it, things would settle down. That is to say, there'd be a flurry of litigation. Um, companies wouldn't quite know what to do because this would be a whole new world. But at the same time, as we're mentioning before, really, if what we think is important about the way that intermediary liability works online is that we largely want to make sure these companies get to make their own decisions about what to take down, at least. Not much should change except procedurally. That is to say, if you're if you're trying to bring crazy causes of action that say, I don't like the fact that you kicked me off of Twitter, that's not going to win in the courts. What will happen without Section 230 is Facebook or Twitter would have to show up and fight it. They have a lot of money, they can do that. So it wouldn't actually necessarily, they would have to shift maybe some of their billions from, I don't know, developing new terrible products into actually defending some of these cases. That may be what part, part of what happens. But um, again, the what, what's really foundational supposedly about Section 230 is that sense of, well, we want these companies to make these decisions. And again, they have the right to do that apart from Section 230. So it'd be a real procedural question. And then there would be all of this, um, sort of uncertainty over, well, how much liability, would we be back to, to some extent, what Jeff was talking about, 1990s, what are we, what are our responsibilities? Are we like a publisher? Are we like a distributor? What kind of responsibilities do we have? And many people who watch this kind of um, space would say, well, what would happen is every company would become incredibly conservative and small C, that is, they take down anything even vaguely controversial because they would worry about getting sued. I don't think that's right. I think that these companies are, their businesses right and companies outside of online companies get sued all the time and and what section 230 going away would actually do is kind of put the tech industry on the same level right as other industries which um obviously is not quite the same because the tech industry deals a lot more with speech which means that we're in a much grayer area for, for lots of um, liability questions but it's not as though employers don't have to worry about Title VII liability and schools don't have to worry about Title IX liability or there's lots of industries and basically everyone apart from tech intermediaries has to worry about getting sued. So tech companies have to worry about getting sued. They'd also continue to worry about making money and they'd figure out a way to make that happen. And your big players are probably going to be fine because they are more powerful than, you know, uh, basically many governments at this point. So would it have an impact on them? Yes, but mostly in terms of maybe slowing down some of their other production and actually having to figure out their uh, how much they want to dedicate to legal resources. Would it crush entering businesses that are trying to make their mark on the, um, in the in the realm of, of the internet? Maybe that's again kind of a conventional wisdom idea is that it would crush the smaller companies. The smaller companies are being crushed right now though because in part, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, lots of, one of the things we can mention that's a bipartisan concern is that we're worried that they're so big. We're worried that they have so much dominance and influence. Well, part of the reason why they have it is because they don't get sued. Part of the reason they have it is because they don't have to dedicate any resources to worrying about getting sued. So they became the massive um, entities that they are partly because they've gotten this kind of bump. Would a new world in which Section 230 didn't exist mean that they would continue to, to take the, the lion's share of all the resources, or would it actually potentially open up a space for a small company that isn't trying to deal with billions of pieces of content, but actually wants to do good and responsible moderation? Would they have, now have a chance that they couldn't have had under Section 230? Maybe. So I think we just really don't know. I want to just pull up, do one, have a follow up on something that you said just a moment ago, and then we're going to move into our closing question. Um, you know, when we talk about the, the focus on Section 230, when there's a focus on it, mostly tends to deal with Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, you know, the, the, the big guns, big tech. But Section 230, uh, depending on your point of view, either empowers, enables, protects many other online organizations as well. I mean, from a, a Yelp with uh, user reviews of you know of restaurants and services or an Airbnb or a or frankly you know news publishers as well who have uh, comments from users. What what um, what would be the implications? What are the implications of some of the changes that we're looking at um, on on those organizations? And then would they be harmed? They certainly could be. I mean, but we have to be fairly precise about what we mean by harmed. I mean, it's absolutely right and important to remember that we're not just talking about the obvious ones, that it, it is very often the case that our conversation about Section 230 gets dominated by a Facebook question, a Twitter question, right? Um, we also do need to think about Google search. We also do need to think about all the things you mentioned, right? Um, but when we think about those, we also need to ask ourselves, 
do we think that we're getting the best possible version of these companies as it is? We think about if we like Yelp, for instance, or if we like Amazon reviews, what is what are we up to now in terms of the most recent studies in terms of how many reviews are completely fake, right? You could actually argue that people know less now because there are no incentives to actually make sure that reviews are authentic or you know whatever the case may be. We're just getting flooded with information and these companies don't have any incentive to do anything but let it all you know hang out right so could we imagine a better version of this. Um, so would they be harmed if what we mean is would they have to put some money towards moderation would they have to put some money towards quality control Would they have to put some resources towards I don't know buying insurance against liability yeah they, they would have to shift their business models. But why would that be bad, right? I mean, that's something we could we could tell that story about tobacco. We could tell that story about um, auto manufacturers. We can tell that story about uh, civil rights legislation, right? It's all or you know you know the American with Disabilities Act. Does it mean that it's going to impose costs on businesses? Yes. And the argument is you do that because it's worth it. And if you don't do it, you are quite literally excluding people from spaces and making things really hard for people to use or actually making them unsafe. So. If we think that those things are important, that people should be safe, that should people should have equality of expression um, or abilities to express themselves, should be free from discrimination on the basis of protected characteristics. If we think we're actually committed to that, that's kind of the entire idea behind these really expensive and burdensome regulations that we have for civil rights and whether or not the tech industry should continue to get a pass from all that. Right. So um, I want to just move to our last question, um, which will be uh, which for both of you. So these, these discussions, these tape conversations we're having are intended to inform the members of our Commission on Information Disorder, as well as the general public. Is there anything about Section 230 that you think the commissioners should know as they prioritize issues and solutions, both for the public sector, the private sector, and civil society? What, what should the commission be, be thinking about? Marianne, we'll, we'll stick with you and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you the closing word, Jeff. So I'd say two major things. Um, one would be that Section 230, even in this discussion and in most discussions, becomes a conversation about speech and about concerns about whether people are going to be silenced, whether there's going to be censorship. And one thing that I think is really important to note that is that the Section 230's text has all these references to speech and publishers and speakers and all of that, but a vast amount of what happens online isn't actually speech, or at least is in some gray zone that would if it weren't happening online, we would consider to be a fight, at least over whether or not that thing is speech. So that one thing we should be looking at is, are we sure that we're protecting free speech values when we're doing things like saying firearms marketplaces um, can't be regulated, right? So I think a huge part of this is not assuming that what we're dealing with here is speech. And the other part is what I've mentioned before, which is compare it to other industries. Um, you know, Try to think about what would the offline cognate of some of these things be? And again, you know, all the comparisons are imperfect, but that's analogies are imperfect. They can still be instructive. Do we really want an industry that, or, or are we stuck with an industry that doesn't get to be regulated or doesn't have to be regulated because we think it's so unique? Or can we say, look, there are really some parallels here um, between the way that um, employers now have to deal with sexual harassment claims, that they have to be preemptive about it, not just that they have to respond to these claims, but they actually have to train their employees against certain things that could violate civil rights. Um, do we think that the kinds of extended liability that hotels might have for security purposes, right? You know, the whole controversy over, you know, one of the mass shootings that took place out of a hotel window, should the hotel management have noticed the fact that the, the gunman there was kept bringing up several suitcases um, that no one ever bothered to check? Um, those conversations where we actually try to get a handle on harm and say, well, it's not just about the last person who pulls the trigger. It's about everything that happens up to that moment that then creates this possibility for foreseeable harm. If we have that perspective and we're sort of getting rid of some of our tech exceptionalism, could we have a section 230 and an approach to intermediary liability that's actually reasonable as opposed to exceptional? Can we keep in mind the fact that it's not unique to the internet, that people are going to have to take on burdensome regulations if they want to make their products safe? Um, that free speech itself, even if we are talking about pure speech, has all kinds of restrictions on it, that we don't just let people say whatever they want. There's all kinds of speech that actually does generate genuine causes of action. Um, and do we want the tech industry to be, um, especially given the, the last 20 years and where we've ended up, do we think we've struck the right balance? Or do we think it's actually starting to resemble something like the firearms industry that has been getting in which is probably maybe the only other industry that's getting that same kind of deference of, 
we'll just let you guys sort it out. You don't need to worry about um, safe storage or you know, smart guns or anything like that. We just think that people can take these incredibly dangerous weapons and and it'll all work out in the end. And if there's terrible things that happen, that's regrettable, but you know, constitution, you know, second amendment rights, what have you. Do we really want that to play out in the same way with the tech industry or do we want to demand something better and can we demand something better? Yeah, not unique to the, to, to the internet certainly, but, but um, not something that the big tech companies have been used to dealing with is, the, is this kind of heavy regulation. Um, Jeff, um, uh, same, same question to you. Yeah, so I, I I just have a few points that I really want to reinforce. Uh, the first is that it's not just about big tech when you talk about Section 230. And I feel like all of the oxygen in this debate, in the public debate and the media coverage has been about Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. And that's about it, that they're the ones who their CEOs get called to Congress. And Section 230 and the internet that really, the culture that it's fostered for good and for bad is not just about these platforms. It is about community news sites uh, that, and I mean, I've been a lawyer for community news sites and uh, we've been able to keep up user comments that uh, criticize local officials because of Section 230. It's also about small, uh, really bad actor websites. The New York Times recently had a great story about them that really uh, encourage uh, really life ruining types of content and have policies against taking it down and allow people to really ruin people's lives with defamation. Um, th those are two extremes, but there's a whole wide range of good and bad actors that are affected by 230. And I feel like the debate has been uh, really skewed and misinformed by um, only focusing on these few large platforms. Uh, I also think that the debate we're having has um, gone on with a lot of assumptions and uh, really not a completely accurate picture of both what's happening and what's possible uh, in terms of what's happening. You, I mean, I think a lot of these concerns about, you know, the platforms are out to get uh, certain political uh, beliefs uh, and you hear anecdotes. And I mean, some of the anecdotes might isolated could be troubling, but then you sort of peel back and look at the rest of the story. Um, but if someone says to me, does Facebook or Twitter or any platform uh, discriminate against a polit particular political viewpoint, I can't say yes or no, because we, we just don't know. And I feel like that's just representative of so much of the debate. We have anecdotes. Uh, we do not have a really good comprehensive picture. Um, similarly, in terms of what kinds of moderation is possible when you're dealing with content at scale, when you're dealing with um, Twitter that has thousands of tweets per second, when you're dealing with the platform with 2 billion users or a small platform that might have millions of posts per minute or per hour, but only 50 employees because it's suddenly become a viral platform, what kind of moderation is possible? I often hear people think you could kind of throw AI at the problem and that often doesn't work. So I, I feel like um, we're, we're, we're really scratching the surface and I, I'd like to see, I mean, I, I've for a while now been calling for a congressional commission uh, as nonpartisan as possible to be able to really um, investigate uh, and figure out what both what's going on and what solutions are possible rather than kind of this ad hoc, let's come up with dozens of proposals and see what sticks. Uh, and the, the third is, the third point that I really wanna drive home is that platforms will react to changes to section 230. We saw this a few years ago uh, with FOSTA. Uh, I mean, platforms have lawyers, they're risk averse, and they will make changes. That can be good or bad, but I think um, the, they, they will react. And, they, and I, so I think we need to be very careful and uh, deliberate in proposing changes because that will cause the platforms to change, to alter their practices. So my, my, um, just my, my plea is just to have a much more reasoned debate and gather more facts before we start making changes which is exactly what we're trying to do with the Commission on Information Disorder. So uh, so thank you for that. Um, Jeff Kossoff, Marianne Franks, thank you so much. It's such a confusing topic for so many and you've really 
just brought so much uh, clarity and light. So uh, this story continues. But in the meantime, thanks very much. Thank you.